to the words of Paul. But first, I want to reflect with you on the tableau we are presented in John's Gospel today. I don't think a telenovela today could be more dramatic in a theatrical sense than the situation that arises at a dinner given by Lazarus in Bethany to honor Jesus before he enters Jerusalem. We have the apostles, including Judas Iscariot, the one who will betray Jesus. Various disciples, including the triad that seems to have been a chosen family for Jesus, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Those of us who are queer know how important such a family can be, especially if our given family struggles to accept us. And it appears that Jesus has once again managed to shock the dinner guests, but chiefly Judas this time. Have you noticed, it seems Jesus is always shocking people at dinner. Who he eats with, what he eats, what he says, what he does. I seriously wonder at this point if people invite him to dinner just to see what he's going to do next. <laughs> what struck me is worth focusing on in this dinner, or at this dinner, I should say, is Mary's devotion to Jesus. Once again, she fails to help Martha in the traditional duties that would be expected of her. And on the other hand, she engages with Jesus in a most intimate and, well, let's be frank, scandalous manner. Her hair is unbound and uncovered, and she is touching Jesus with her unbound hair. She is showing a complete lack of concern for her status and privilege, a total disregard for the decorum of the time. As I was reflecting on this homily, as a teacher, I was wondering what would happen if I came into my classroom and one of my observant Muslim young ladies removed her job, and I was like, I, I wouldn't even know what to say. I mean, the shock would be just overwhelming. That, that's just not done. For women for whom this is a, an important mark of their modesty, they just do not remove this veil. And so, I know it's hard for us to get just how shocking this was to the dinner guests, but it would definitely have been noticed. And people at the party would have thought Mary was being, at the least, foolish, and at the most, definitely inappropriate. It struck me, though, that maybe, maybe, Mary was just simply showing her rabbi her teacher, that she gets it. She understands his teachings. Remember, she is the one that spends time when he visits at his feet, listening to every word, much to Martha's chagrin. She understands his teachings. After all, Jesus is going to commit a very similar act of humility and love at the very last dinner he will attend. So maybe it is she that we should thank for the washing of the feet. And of course, what Jesus is about to do is the very reason I think John uses this moment of intimacy for his own purpose. Given the knowledge his community has as to the fate and mission of Jesus, remember everything is known, everything fated to be in John's gospel. It is not only clear to us what is going to happen to Jesus in a week's time, it is clear to Jesus himself. And so this moment of intimacy with Jesus is a preparation for his burial. A burial we can only assume that Mary foresees as well. Mary knows that she will not have Jesus with her much longer. So she throws all caution to the wind. She doesn't care what others think of her. She loves Jesus. He has understood her, and he has defended her and brought her to the infinite mercy of God. 
And she is honoring him in the most profound and generous way she knows how. And Jesus loves her and is grateful to her for her generosity of spirit and of means. He knows very well what this excessive generosity has cost her. So now let us turn to Paul. At first glance, what he shares with the disciples in Philippi seems not so intimate, not so much an obvious declaration of love. Read it again. His greatest treasure in all the world was his Jewish identity and faithfulness to the law. And he has given all of it up for a relationship with a person he never even knew in the flesh. Nothing is as important to him as this relationship, not the law, no mores, no other responsibility, no family, only to be faithful to what he believes Jesus is asking him to do in the experience of him, in the relationship he has with him, in the Holy Spirit in his heart. If I'm honest, I find Paul and Mary's all-in love for Jesus rather unnerving. I mean, I love Jesus. I hope I love Jesus. It would be a little odd for a priest in the church to be here <laughs> preaching if I didn't love Jesus. So no, I, I truly, I love him. I never knew him in the flesh either. But my heart cries out to him. He is my way. I, I try to follow very poorly. But would I give all I have? Would I, like Mary, really ris risk the respect and goodwill of everyone I know just for him? Just for Jesus? It is the question I am left with here at the end of Lent as we wait for Jesus to enter Jerusalem to endure his passion and death for us. His words to Judas I find very haunting this morning. You do not always have me.